welcome to another edition of Cop Talk, Two Jews Offer Their Views on the News. I am Bob Cohn, Editor-in-Chief Emeritus of the St. Louis Jewish Light, and with me is Larry Levin, the publisher and CEO of the Light. Also with us is Miriam, who is our producer and production associate for this program. Larry, it appears that barring some miracle, the Israel-Palestinian peace process of Secretary of State John Kerry gave it a valiant effort, but it looks like it was rather promising for a while, and now it's utterly doomed. Uh, what are your thoughts? Can it be revived, or is it like the Frankenstein monster? You are a Jew, and you don't believe in miracles? Is that what you're telling That's me? For sure. <laughs> Gloria said you have to be believe in miracles if you're going to be a Jew. I don't know. I mean, so many boneheaded things have happened in the course of this. The latest was, you know, uh, Abbas, you know, going to 15 different international organizations to seek state sovereignty, um, you know, the offer, the, the so-called tripartite offer by which Jonathan Pollard would be yeah, released was, was kind of a, 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 a boneheaded ploy, mostly because, you know, as you think about it, you know, um, the United States was given up, Pollard, Israel was given up 26 prisoners, the Palestinians, all they were being asked to do was basically... Um, extend peace talks for another nine months, which they could stall out. So there wasn't really a lot on the table. Um, having said all that, um, I am uh, so impressed by Senator Kerry's efforts. You don't have to agree with everything he says, but this guy didn't have to do this. I mean, I don't even think President Obama made him do this. I think this is a labor of conviction and love and dedication and commitment. Um, whether you agree or disagree with his, his thoughts and principles. What and do I, do, I do give him all the credit in the world for, for making it a focused effort involving himself rather than delegating it to one He's of these He's been there, what, 20 boys. times in the last six months, yeah. Uh, what was making it work for a long time was the fact that both sides seemed to be honoring a confidentiality aspect of it, and all of a sudden everything was made public. The Pollard thing really uh, threw a monkey wrench into the whole operation because it looked like there, were, there was a, a level of desperation involved, it was not just the 26 prisoners, there was another 400 prisoners on top of that. Yeah. Moribund Barguti got thrown this. I hope that after a cooling off period that there can be a resumption because there's a growing feeling that the worst thing for Israel is a two-state solution, but even worse than that is a lack of a two-state solution. There's and, no and place else to go. There's a lot of debate uh, about what the demographics of the future look like in Israel, and, and some people question you know, what the demographic uh, assertions that started all this, which was basically what Tom Friedman was writing about in 1998, you know, 15 right. years ago, and demographic uh, trends have changed. But, but I'm not sure that the, um, the levels of intransigence have really changed, and I still think, uh, in my opinion, a one-state a one state solution is, is pretty much untenable. I completely agree, and I, I would hope that they'll move toward my suggestion of many years standing, preemptive recognition of what the Palestinian Authority is now as a state, get it to the United Nations, and then negotiate the borders. And, and even, the other though, way even though I haven't agreed with you entirely on that, at least then you have the accountability that all sovereign states are held to, exactly. which really the Palestinian uh, uh, leaders have really not been held to to this point. Shifting to something a little bit more encouraging in the uh, region, are the relatively peaceful and smooth elections in Afghanistan that so far at least appear to have gone smoothly with a few glitches, despite the efforts of the Taliban. Are you encouraged by this development? Uh, in the very, very, very short run. Yeah, <laughs> you know, to be encouraged that, by that. Uh, yeah, and we, you know, we don't know, we don't know uh, what the longer term reaction from the Taliban will be, and we don't know what other terror groups will join the Taliban to try and foment dissent you know, on the heels of this. You know, everybody was, not everybody, but a lot of people were very excited when Iraq first conducted their right. elections. And, you know, we've seen how that's played out. victory with the ink stains. <laughs> yeah, the exactly. yeah. So, so cautiously optimistic, but we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, and uh, kind of segueing into, from the Middle East, into something that has a local component. Uh, we had a fairly controversial meeting at the St. Louis Hillel recently in which uh, the J Street group on the campus, uh, Hillel hosted a gathering in which a former member of the IDF made some very scathing criticisms 
of Israel, and then there was a rejoinder from another IDF veteran from Yale, he had Yale against Harvard in this fracas. It's getting difficult for me to understand where is the mainstream, I was at a meeting, uh, the APAC event last night, there were 375 people which filled the uh, mm -hmm. ballroom of the Ritz-Carlton. Do we have an idea of where the mainstream view on Israel is anymore in this community? In the Jewish community? In the Jewish community of St. Louis. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, those who have tried to bring everyone together have said the continued existence and safety and security uh, of Israel um, has been the, the, the one thing that has connected people. Then if you add on the... Uh, safety and security of Israel as a Jewish state, you have, you still are including most of the Jewish community, I would say, a fairly, fairly wide swath. I think once you get beyond that, in terms of policies or practices of the administration in Israel, of the political parties in Israel, how they deal with uh, the world, the United States, uh, non-Jewish uh, communities, uh, the, the Israeli-Palestinian issue, I think you have so much divergence of opinion. What do you think? I think there is, too. I, I'm beginning to think, though, that the, the kind of traditional, almost automatic, giving Israel the benefit of the doubt that I kind of grew up with has itself become a minority position. I'm sensing among younger people a highly critical, in most cases still loving, but very, very critical uh, opinion of Israel and uh, a reluctance to really condemn things that are happening in Israel's neighborhood, which kind of concerns me. Well, I think, that's, I think that's why some of the traditionalists would say, hey, you youngins, you're being duped by the uh, BDS movement, right. you know, by those who question Israel. Really, it is basically an effort to subvert um, support for the state of Israel. And there is evidence, of course, that there are groups that are anti-Israel who have strongly supported the BDS movement. So right. there's no one right answer, but there's no question that there are elements. But again, you have a bridge in generations, and hasn't that always caused dissension in our culture? It and certainly our history? has. So, Before yeah. Israel came into existence and, and continuing into the future. Right. Now we also have some other concerns uh, as Jews. We always do all over the world. The national elections in France a weekend ago, the ultra right wing National Front Party scored impressive gains in many mm -hmm. municipal elections party was at one time regarded as openly pro-fascist and is still on the very far fringe of the right in France. Should French Jews and Jews in general be concerned about this development? I think so. And, you know, you see what's going on with the Javik party in Hungary, you know, even more so than they're trying to um, present a uh, politically correct kind of position to the public. But you still, you know, hear, spew, uh, hear venom spewed, you know, by individuals associated with some of these extremist parties. So, so the question is, is it, are they trying to create simply a perception of a more mainstream party in France, in Hungary, wherever, yeah. or are they trying to create a substantively more mainstream party that doesn't tolerate discrimination? I think your guess is as good as mine. Um, one thing that, that, that I think is very important is that we really focus on these kinds of issues relative to anti-Semitism. As I wrote about a couple weeks in the paper, a big debate about whether Seth MacFarlane, you know, and, and Family Guy, you know, is anti-Semitic in some ways. In some ways, that can undercut these more serious uh, discussions. Because, because if, you, if you deal with, to me, the, 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 more, the more minor and trifling things that are wrapped up in parody and satire, sure. I think in some way it can diminish the importance of focusing on these really truly horrific elements that are that are deliberately potentially deliberately trying to um, sabotage uh, Jewish efforts around the world. And, and uh, we wrote about this last week in the light about the French the, issue. The French issue, and I expressed we expressed the hope that the, there used to be a pro-communist vote. They had a strong communist party at one time in democratic France, and mostly it was a protest vote against the, what they perceived to be the weakness of the mainstream parties. The difficulty with that is that you can end up with as they did in Greece with members of the Golden Dawn who were openly pro-Nazi in the parliament. The other question is when, when is anti-Semitism being used as a sword and when is it being used as a shield? We've seen in the Ukraine, you know, where there were Russian interests that said, oh, Jews, you don't want to be associated with the Ukraine. Right. There are strong anti-Semitic sentiments there. Well, you know, then you talk to the man and woman on the street and the rabbis in the Ukraine and they say, well, there have been voices but by and large, things have been relatively peaceful and respectful in recent years. 
And now, so you certainly don't want anti-Semitism bandied about for that price. Right. There's a kind of anti-anti-Semitism. <laughs> yeah. And Putin, to his credit, has been protective of the Jewish community of Russia, but that should not entitle him to a free pass to behave like the fascist dictators of the 30s towards his neighbors. Exactly. So it's, it's a real concern. There were also some major developments recently uh, closer to home. The U.S. Supreme Court, a case brought by the Hobby Lobby Company challenging the right of the government under the Affordable Care Act to provide a contraceptive and abortion-inducing drugs to their employees based on religious belief. And the other was a decision last week which reaffirmed the controversial Citizens United case and actually broadened it, which removes virtually all limits on political campaign contributions except to individuals. I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts in mind. On Way too much decisions. to talk about. Yeah. It, it, it appears that the current Supreme Court uh, majority does believe that entities should have the same rights as individuals, does believe, errs strongly on the side of keeping uh, government off the back of businesses and those who fund political, um, political campaigns. Um, you know, th there's a really hard place in our society where expression of ideas, exp expression through speech and religion kind of clashes with kind of looking at progressive movements and trying to do things for the society as a whole that, that the people who are advocating them view as very constructive. The Affordable Care Act is one such place. You know, it's not as though, you know, those who are advocating for better health care for Americans are saying we're trying to trample religious rights. It just happens to be that this, this issue is at the intersection. It's an intersection that has divided Jews. Those in the more uh, observant Jewish communities have said, well, if you can force a company to uh, fund contraceptive care, could you not also impede um, the um, kosher slaughter practices, exactly. you know, for those who, who sell uh, kosher meat. Um, you know, I'm sympathetic to that. I'm not sure it would come to that, and I think there are distinctions that can be drawn in the law that would take care of that, notwithstanding that these are, these are very, very hot-button issues. All sound points. I was encouraged by the fact that the court yesterday let stand a lower court ruling that upheld the law against discriminating against uh, the LGBT community on, uh, for photography and floral arrangements at weddings. Yeah, it was actually, it was actually in a, if I remember right, I think it was in Arizona. And Correct. It, and it was, a, it was a, a cake topper that a gay couple wanted inscribed, and the, and the provider of services didn't want to inscribe it, claiming that that was an infringement of their free speech rights to, uh, to be told that they had to inscribe it thusly, and the Supreme Court refused to hear it, which was a fascinating decision. Yeah, it so, really was. It was very encouraging. It was yeah. the last minute one. We're almost out of time, and I'm wondering if as Passover approaches, if you have any message to our readers and viewers. Yes, appreciate the, the society we live in, what we are given, uh, what we're blessed with in this country, um, and may everybody have a, a wonderful Passover and a great Seder. And I will say amen to that, and thanks to you, Larry. Thanks to you, Miriam. You did a great job in your debut producing of this Cop Talk program. Until next time. Take care. Bye.